Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Lathe Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started in machining. This is episode 12, Surface Finishes. 12? 12? I started doing this finger thing at the beginning of the series, and I didn't think ahead for what was going to happen above 10. And, uh, oh, what am I even doing with my life? So let's start by taking a quick look at the extremes of surface finish. This is a very poor surface finish, and uh, you can see it's actually corroded. And uh, this is uh, the, the, one of the very first things I ever machined, so as you can see it's a skill that you need to develop. At the other extreme, the very best surface finishes come from surface grinding, and uh, this is a piece of O1 tool steel that's been precision ground at the factory, so uh, this is uh, about as good as it gets. So why does surface finish matter? Well, obviously this part is a lot prettier than this one, and the true deep-seated desire of every machinist is to make things pretty, uh, but it matters for a number of practical reasons as well. First and foremost is precision. If I'm taking a dimension off of this part, when you get down into really precise dimensions, you get into the tenths and the hundredths of thousandths, then what happens is the depth of the tool marks or the fine grooves on the surface start to overwhelm the precision that you need out of the reading. And so what you're actually reading then is the tops of your tool marks and uh, you're kind of averaging them out. So the better your surface finish is, the, the better you can hit dimensions and the more precise and consistent those dimensions will be. An example of where that starts to matter is with something like a bearing fit up where uh, this might be pressed onto a shaft and the specifications for this bearing might call for an interference fit of you know plus and minus a few tenths, uh, in which case your surface finish uh, needs to be good so that you can hit that dimension and have the exact right uh, press on interference without damaging uh, the bearing. And in fact, that's part of why uh, high quality bearings such as this one have very high quality ground surfaces on inside and out. Another example is heat treating. Uh, this is O1 tool steel that has been hardened and then tempered back with a torch. And when you're tempering by eye, uh, you, need to, you need to be able to see the color of the surface. So this is a kind of a yellow brown, and this is a kind of a blue verging on indigo. And the color tells you the hardness of that material as you're tempering it, so you know when to stop. And if the surface finish is poor, as on this guy, it's quite difficult to tell uh, you know, what color it is and where you've got, gotten to and, you know, when to stop tempering. So uh, in order to get a, an accurate uh, temper, you really need a, a smooth, clean surface. And lastly, I'll call out uh, further surface treatments that you might, might want to do. So this part here, this is a, a shop-made tailstock die holder, and uh, this was cold blued with uh, Brownells Oxville Blue. And uh, cold bluing is a process that uh, really responds well to a good surface finish. Basically, the better your surface finish is, uh, the better the uh, cold bluing process is going, going to come out. Another important reason is corrosion resistance. So you can see how this part has a lot of flash rust on the surface. Uh, you know, surfaces rust when moisture collects in imperfections in that surface. So uh, these two parts here are actually the same age, and this guy has flash rusted quite badly, and this guy looks factory fresh. So uh, the, the better your surface finish is, the longer unprotected steel can go without rusting. So when you're making tooling or things like that that you want to be unpainted, uh, a good surface finish is very important there as well. Now I showed the extremes of surface finish earlier, but the average home machinist is going to be working kind of in this middle range of mediocrity and within which there's a fair amount of variation as well. So uh, the first way you can tell uh, how good your finish is, of course, is just by feeling it. If it feels smooth, it's probably good. Uh, but sometimes things will feel smooth, uh, but then if you run your fingernail on it, uh, I'll just hold it up to the microphone here you can hear that it's actually uh, not smooth and you can feel that uh, with your thumbnail as well. It varies a bit by material as well. So while smooth and reflective are always rules of thumb, uh, steel is always going to show those tool marks a little bit more than some other materials. Uh, brass tends not to show tool marks, so it looks good on camera. Brass makes everybody look like a good machinist. Uh, and uh, aluminum, on the other hand, is interesting because it really shows the tool marks. You know, you can s very clearly see on camera that this was done with a half-inch end mill, but in fact, it's glassy smooth to the touch. So even though you can see the tool marks, and actually they show up more on camera than they do in person, uh, but even though you can see the tool marks, uh, the part is actually very smooth. So uh, learning to recognize surface finish on different materials uh, by feel and by sight is, is helpful.
Now, claiming to be an authority on surface finishes on the internet is a bit like showing your welds and expecting nobody to criticize them, but uh, I do want to show you at least what a decent surface finish on steel looks like. So as I said, it's smooth and shiny, but uh, the key here is that when you look closely, the grain of the material is kind of the dominant feature. You see the grain of the material more than you see tool marks. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb there. Oh, but look at this. As good as that surface finish is, magnification is what separates the girls from the women. So here on the macro lens, you can actually see the tool marks as well as the grain of the steel uh, in this surface. So uh, even though something might uh, look really, really good and feel really, really good, uh, a close-up look at it gives you a pretty good view of what's actually happening to the material. Choice of alloy also matters. This, the quality of surface between these two parts is different, not just because there's years of experience on my part between them, uh, but also because this is mild steel and this is 12L14 free machining steel. Uh, this has a very small amount of lead in it, which uh, makes it machine very, very nicely, makes uh, good chip action, and uh, makes it much easier to achieve a good surface finish. So, pro tip, if you want to look like a good machinist on YouTube, do everything in 12 l 14 steel. Okay, enough show and tell. Now, what actually creates good and bad surface finishes? Well, I think the easiest way to demonstrate that is to create a bad one, something that I am uniquely qualified to do. Okay, so I've pretty much done all the things that lead to a bad surface finish here, just shy of actual chatter. Uh, as you can see, I got lousy chip action. I ended up with a bird's nest. My chips weren't breaking, so that means my speeds and feeds weren't right. And if I get this mess out of here. All right. Whew. All right. And remember, now this is actually 12 of 14 steel too, so this is the stuff that's easy to get a good surface finish with. Yet I've still managed to bungle it up definitely fails the fingernail test. So this is this is a lousy surface finish. In fact, you can even just feel it. Okay, I brought you in real close so we can see what's actually happening. Now remember that lathes are single point cutting tools, and that means only the very point of this tool is doing the cutting. So if you think about what that means, this material is spinning, and this point here is moving across the surface at a regular speed. What the lathe is actually doing is cutting a very fine thread. It's making a helix. And the lathe is always doing this, even when you're not cutting threads intentionally. So a bad surface finish is effectively a really fine thread, which, you know, you might actually brag about. Look at this incredibly fine thread I made. Uh, but no, that's not what we want. Now, the other effect that you can see, if you look really close here, is that there's actually like little balls or little lumps on the surface. And that's where the chip action was bad. So the material wasn't cutting cleanly as the tool passed over it, the material was actually kind of getting torn off. And uh, that creates like little burrs and little balls and little lumps of steel that uh, uh, are a lot of what you can feel as well. So the fact that a poor surface finish is actually a very fine thread is the key to understanding how to improve your surface finishes. Now, if you think about thread cutting, uh, you do that with a very fine pointed tool. If you tried to cut a thread with a, with a round tool, uh, it would just sort of smear your threads all over the place. And in fact, that's exactly what we want to do when we're trying to create a good uh, surface finish is smear the thread all over the place. So if we use, so here's an exaggerated round nose tool, so you can kind of see what we're talking about. Imagine this tool moving over the surface, and you can kind of see how as it moved, the blunt nose on this guy would kind of overlap previous passes and kind of blur them all together. And uh, so this is why a, a round nose tool is always going to give you a much nicer finish is because uh, it's going to kind of average out the, uh, the, the tiny thread marks that you're making. Now in steel, this might be a more typical nose radius that you would, uh, that you would use. It's hard to see from the top, but if I show you the end here, uh, you can see how the end of that tool has kind of been rounded over. So that little bit of nose radius there will give us a much nicer surface finish. And in contrast, here's the uh, tool that we used for that poor surface finish demonstration. And you can see on the end that it's actually completely sharp. There's no, no radius there at all. And in fact, to make matters even worse, the point of that guy is actually rolled over a little bit. So this tool needs sharpening. Okay, if round nose tools are so great, then why wouldn't we use uh, a comically large radius like this all the time? Well, the answer is tool pressure. Uh, the larger your nose radius is, the higher your tool pressure is. And we talked about that in the uh, chatter video. And that's why a larger radius tool would have to be reserved for your finishing passes uh, where you're taking light cuts uh, and not removing as much material because you need to avoid chatter. 
Okay, then why would you ever use a very sharp nose tool like this guy if you know it's going to lead to a lousy finish? Well, uh, there are lots of times when you want to minimize tool pressure at all costs. So, for example, on a small machine like this, when I turn tool steel, tool steel is really tough stuff, and uh, I have to use the sharpest tool I've got uh, to prevent chatter. And uh, also, if you're doing roughing passes where you want to remove a lot of material as much as you can at a time, you might use a sharp nose tool because you don't care about surface finish uh, since you're going to be uh, doing uh, finishing passes after the fact. Uh, and then, of course, sharp nose tools are also good for making clean inside shoulders and various other things. But most of the time, uh, a compromised tool like this with a modest uh, radius on it will, uh, will do just fine for all of your roughing and uh, will achieve a satisfactory result on your finishing passes. Now it's not all about tool nose radius. Uh, surface finish is largely about uh, getting your speeds and feeds right. Uh, and in fact, the uh, sharper your nose radius is, the more important this is. Uh, larger uh, tool radii are more forgiving for having not quite perfect speeds and feeds. Uh, and that comes back to what we said about those, those little balls, those little tear marks that are on the surface here that you may not be able to see, but you can feel. Uh, those are due to poor chip action. To get good chip action, we need this material to shear just right when it encounters the tool. If our speed is too slow, the material is just kind of going to get pushed or plowed. Uh, and if it's too high, the material is going to start tearing. So uh, getting it just right is key. So that includes uh, a lot of factors. Of course, the surface speed has to be correct. And you can look it up in the books, uh, what your surface speed for each material should be. Though, honestly, a lot of the books are written for maximum production on large machines, uh, often with carbide, if not otherwise specified. Uh, so I think it's better to just kind of experiment in your own shop and uh, get the feel of it. But uh, a number of rules of thumb apply. Uh, first and foremost, your tool needs to be sharp and your tool angles need to be correct. Uh, so if you're grinding your own tool bits, uh, make sure that you know, all your angles are right. It's part of why uh, when learning, I strongly recommend buying pre-ground sets uh, to eliminate that learning curve. When you're trying to improve your surface finishes, uh, you need to eliminate as many variables as you can. And uh, you don't want to be trying to learn the skill of grinding tool bits and perfecting surface finishes at the same time. And the other interesting thing about speeds and feeds is that we can uh, manipulate them within the desired range for the material to get the effect we want. So uh, remember again that this is with the sharp nose tool is effectively cutting a very fine thread. Well, uh, the faster this material is spinning and the slower this tool is moving across the material, the finer that thread will be. And if that thread gets fine enough, it actually starts to just become one surface. So uh, you can picture that when deciding on your speeds and feeds. Now, uh, the slower the surface is moving to a point, uh, not, you know, not too slow, but if this is moving slower and this tool is uh, feeding slower, then you can take deeper cuts. Now, if you're in a hurry to remove material, you're going to want to take a deeper cut, which means your surface speed is going to need to be a little bit lower. And you're also going to want this feed to be higher because you're in a hurry. Uh, and so that will allow you to remove as much material as possible uh, in a short amount of time. But of course, your surface finish is going to be poor. So you put all that together and it gives you your basic rule of thumb for speeds and feeds, which is higher surface speed, slower feed gives a better finish, and lower surface speed, higher feed will remove material more efficiently. Okay, so putting all of that together, when you're going for best possible surface finish on your final pass, you want to do a shallow cut, maybe 10 thousandths, and you want a higher spindle speed, and you want a slower feed. So high speed, slow feed, round nose, shallow cut is going to maximize your surface finish quality. But wait, there's one more tool in our surface finish arsenal, and that's cutting fluid. Uh, cutting fluid uh, improves your chip action and also helps clear chips away from the cutting tool so that uh, chips from previous passes don't scratch up uh, the material if they get caught under the tool bit, that sort of thing. So uh, when, it, when you're really worried about your surface finish, a little bit of cutting oil uh, will always help. So uh, something like uh, Tap Magic, uh, I like for steel and for softer materials, uh, aluminum, uh, copper and brass, I like WD-40. And cutting fluid has uh, other magic powers as well. Uh, it's useful in roughing passes uh, because it will uh, burn off and uh, carry the heat with it and keep the temperature down on your cut, which is always a good idea. Uh, and of course, helps uh, clear chips for roughing as well. So cutting fluid's never a bad idea. Okay, so let's see if we can put our learnings to use. I've got a fresh hone on my tool here, and this is the moderate round nose tool. I've increased my spindle speed a little bit. I've slowed down my feed. And uh, we're going to do a sixth thou pass. 
and uh, we'll get some uh, cutting oil on there and let's see if we can put our surface finish where our mouth is debris off of there okay so that feels very very smooth you can probably still see the tool marks on camera because they always show up on camera but uh, certainly passes the fingernail test I can't feel any any marks on that surface at all it's very very smooth you know there's always room for improvement but hey showing something less than perfect on YouTube is a surefire way to get negative com I mean engagement so let's say you ended up with a surface finish that uh, isn't as good as you need, uh, but you don't want to redo the whole part. Is there anything we can do to rescue it? Well, remember at the top of the show we said that the very best surface finishes come from a grinder. And the reason for that is because the, uh, the size of the tool is effectively dust, and so your tool marks are microscopic. And uh, we can get there ourselves with emery paper. Now anytime you're doing any kind of grinding or sanding on the lathe, uh, using any kind of stone-based uh, tools, you, uh, you always want to protect your ways uh, because all stone-based tools shower grit and that grit is harder than everything on the lathe. So that grit is going to collect on your, on your precision surfaces and damage them over time as things move around. So always protect your ways and uh, now we can get busy. So we're going to start with uh, 400 grit emery paper and when you're doing this uh, you want to hold uh, the paper with your fingertips just in case something grabs you don't want your fingers to get pulled in anywhere so you want to hold it such that uh, the lathe is just going to pull it out of your fingers if anything happens. You just kind of work it back and forth. You can already see it getting shinier there and in fact uh, a longer piece of emery paper is a good idea but this is what I've got so that's what I'm using. Now, if you're going to do this, uh, you know, make sure you've got room left in your dimension because you can easily take off a half thou or more uh, by doing this. And in fact, if you need a really precise dimension, say in the tenths range, finishing up with emery paper is a really easy way to do that. So now we're up to 1,000 here, and the goal of each pass is just to effectively remove the sanding marks from the previous pass. And we're going to go up to 2,000 now, and so now a little bit of oil never hurts. Uh, and the oil just keeps the sanding area clean, it keeps the grit from collecting in the paper. Okay, so now the surface is just like butter. Now, uh, the tool marks actually look worse, but that's an optical illusion in a sense, because what you're seeing is the tool marks that were a little deeper, say, you know, a couple hundred thousandths deeper than uh, the other areas here, which, you know, we've made really shiny. If you really want to get rid of all the tool marks, you need to go further with the 400 grit until all tool marks are gone. But remember, if you do that, you're probably going to take, you know, three, four tenths off of your dimension, uh, if not more. Uh, if you get carried away with the 400, you can easily take off a thousandth or two. So uh, be careful with that. But uh, if you need to rescue a mediocre, mediocre surface finish, emery paper can definitely do it. So that is surface finishes in a nutshell. I hope you found something in here useful. And uh, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. There's a link down there in the description. And we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.